Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us once again. In this segment this morning, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Robert Gottlieb. He's joining us here to talk about a newly FDA-approved Amvutra. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Robert Gottlieb. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Neil. Tell us a a bit about yourself. I do understand that you are practicing in Dallas. Yes, I'm a uh, transplant cardiologist, an advanced heart failure provider, but I also think of myself as a physician scientist I have a background in RNA chemistry, and it's really re- very rewarding to see things that started off in the laboratory actually make its way finally to the clinic to be able to start helping provide relief to patients uh, for many conditions. Now, are you exclusively transplant oriented, or do you see a, a wide variety of heart patients? I see the wide variety of cardiomyopathy patients, basically people that have a problem with their heart. But I also like to think of myself as an internist rather than just a cardiologist, because after all, a cardiologist is an internist with a special interest in cardiology. And that really puts the patient back at the center of the entire conversation. If a patient comes to me as a cardiologist and talks about domains outside of cardiology, it's really my duty and need to actually explore the symptoms that they're describing. After all, a patient's not just a symptom, not just a single organ system, but they actually have a a variety of complaints. And many times a single condition may link uh, the disease um, with symptoms uh, in multiple different domains that span different providers. And really a lot of times patients are looking for a provider that can recognize the signs and symptoms of what may be a rare disease and that might be under-recognized. In fact, that's what we'll talk about today. Was cardiology your your first love uh, going into medicine or was there a, a journey that led you to this specialty? Well, actually, I think uh, good science and good medicine uh, leads uh, to a lot of rewards for anyone that's curious. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I have a a passionate interest in genetics, um, and uh, that has actually been very helpful uh, through the course of the pandemic. And it's also, even before and after the pandemic, has been really rewarding to be able to tailor therapies to the actual disease that somebody has, um, I, in the future, I think we'll be tailoring a lot more cardiac uh, um, gene-specific um, therapies uh, to, for patients, basically genetically informed uh, therapies. Um, and the first genetically informed therapy to really affect a lot of patients has been uh, the therapies that are brought around by siRNA, although actually those are actually labeled for polyneuropathy. Um, So, like I said, a lot of patients come to me with a symptom in more than one domain. They might complain to me of their tingling on their feet, their legs. Um, They may even complain to me about irritable bowel uh, syndrome-like symptoms that alternate with diarrhea and constipation. And Mm -hmm. gosh, if I have a patient in front of me that's all they want to talk about, I want to get them over to a GI doctor. But in, in, in addition to all the other things that one might think about, when I see that linked with polyneuropathy and with uh, cardiomyopathy, I start thinking about rare underdiagnosed conditions such as ATTR amyloidosis, specifically hereditary ATTR amyloidosis, which is a rare underdiagnosed disease and present in about 50,000 people worldwide, uh, perhaps maybe a little bit more. Um, it is certainly underdiagnosed. And although it has the name hereditary uh, transthyretin amyloidosis, and it is due to a single gene, uh, although it's hereditary, you would expect a family history present, but in the past, a lot of people didn't get diagnosed, both because of lack of uh, knowledge of the providers as well as the patients. And in the past, we didn't have therapies for this condition. Mm-hmm. And then the first condition, first therapies that came along for hereditary ATTR amyloidosis really focus on the polyneuropathy, the multiple different dimensions of nerve symptoms. And those can actually contribute to someone losing their balance, inability to walk. It's a true neuromusculoskeletal disease because these patients have deposits of amyloid fibrils that can deposit both in the nerves as well as in the muscle. And it can de- uh, deposit, you know, for example, in the legs, it can cause difficulties with gait and falls. Um, it can deposit in the gut, causing this autonomic neuropathy that looks like an irritable bowel syndrome. It can deposit in the nerves uh, in the sympathetic and parasympathetic chains and lead to falls and debility, 
and orthostatic hypotension. And uh, as I mentioned, it can also deposit in muscle. So just as much as it can deposit in skeletal muscle, it can deposit in cardiac muscle, carding a cardiomyopathy. And that's actually, as a cardiologist, why some of these patients come to my attention. But I also may have some patients that just have a pure polyneuropathy or a polyneuropathy predominant phenotype. And that's because they may have been referred to me uh, because they are looking for somebody else that can diagnose that condition. Who's susceptible? Normally, when do symptoms present? The symptoms usually begin in um, young adulthood to mid-adulthood. But there's also variation depending on which uh, gene change somebody has. Uh, there's what we call a prototypic uh, Portuguese hereditary polyneuropathy. It tends to have a little bit of an earlier onset. That's what we call the valine 30 methionine change. Um, and then there's other patients that might have uh, the valine uh, 122 isoleucine change uh, that's present in about 1 in 25 self-identified African Americans or African Caribbean descent uh, patients. Um, and that leads to predisposition to somewhat later onset overall, uh, many times actually instead of being in the third or fourth decade of life, often being in the fifth, sixth, uh, or even later decades of life. In fact, the penetrance is incomplete, especially for uh, the one in the African-American population. However, by the time someone gets to their 80s or 90s, uh, it's um, 80 to 90 percent penetrant. Now, I understand that the uh, FDA has recently approved Amvutra for uh, treatment of this condition. Tell us about this compound and how it actually works to treat. Well, uh, thank you for that question. And by the way, for, for the purposes of this talk, I should disclose that I'm a paid consultant for Allen Island because I'm working with the company to raise awareness for this very important condition and Amvutra as a new treatment option for adults with hereditary ATTR amyloidosis. So Amvutra is a genetically informed therapy. It's a class of compounds that works through the small interfering RNA um, mechanism in cells. Uh, we just came through the pandemic and we know that um, mammalian cells hate seeing double-stranded RNA unless it looks like a tRNA. What Amvutra uh, takes care of, uh, takes, takes advantage of is that natural defense mechanism if you can basically line up and zip up uh, the target sequence with these small 21 nucleotide sequences um, that are complementary to the mRNA, you can target the degradation of these mRNAs to a uh, complex that gets rid of the mRNA so it's not translated into protein and so the body stops making as much of the transthyretin. The transthyretin uh, when it misfolds uh, due to the genetic change, uh, deposits as amyloid fibrils, I'd like to call it schmutz, if you will, mm -hmm. and it gets deposited in the end organs, causing fibrosis of the end organs. What Amvutra does is it knocks down or silences the expression of the transthyretin gene product, so there's less available to misfold and less available to then deposit. And what we've seen through these trials is that it can improve someone's quality of life. Um, they actually can have at the end of a nine month period, um, as seen in the Helios A trial, they have an improvement in their um, primary endpoint of the modified neuropathy impairment score plus seven. It's a multi-domain um, scoring system for sensory, motor, autonomic uh, neuropathy, uh, as well as orthostasis. Uh, patients can actually slightly improve from their baseline by about 2.2 points versus the worsening that has been seen in the historic placebo um, comparator where they actually worsen by about 14.8 uh, points for a 17 point difference between natural history as shown by placebo and Amvutra uh, with this knockdown or silencing therapy. So when a nugget, um, I would call Amvutra a genetically informed silencer and a knockdown uh, therapy. You'll hear the, both of those terms um, utilized. And it is delivered by an injection under the skin by a healthcare provider every three months. In fact, um, Alnylam had a, has a uh, already approved product called Patisserin prior to Ambutra, and Ambutra has been approved this summer. They both share the same indication 
for polyneuropathy due to hereditary ATTR amyloidosis, pitocerin is given by an infusion once every three weeks, whereas Invutra is given by a subcutaneous injection uh, by a healthcare provider every three months. I have patients that have preferences for one or the other. They have very comparable um, outcomes uh, based on uh, the way that the data from these trials has shown. And I have some patients that really like the infusion every three weeks because they've gotten to know their provider, they've gotten to know their nurse. It's almost like going to a salon or barbershop every three weeks. And so they continue on with patisserin or Ampatro. In other patients, uh, either because they came through the trial uh, for Mvutra uh, or Vutricerin, um, or because they want to be able to regain that time that they were otherwise spending uh, getting the infusions, they can now opt for this once every three month injection and really regain uh, that time. So it is another treatment option. Uh, for some patients, one therapy is right. For another, uh, the other might be right. But basically, on Patro, as well as Amvutra are both treatment options now uh, for patients. And this is really an important thing because prior to four years ago, we didn't have any therapies that were FDA approved for hereditary ATTR amyloidosis. And now we have several. Well, what about some of the, the safety concerns surrounding Mvutra? You know, Neil, that's a great question. Um, during the Helios A clinical trial, the most common adverse reactions that patients reported were joint pain, shortness of breath, and uh, we observed low vitamin A levels. That's because transthyretin is a transporter uh, for vitamin A. So we do advise patients to keep an eye on their night vision. And if there's any changes in their night vision or night blindness, to seek uh, evaluation with an ophthalmologist. Well, doctor, if you would give our listeners a website where we can learn more about the Amvutra. Um, the website that uh, your listeners can go to is called amvutra.com. That is A-M-V as in Victor, U as in uniform, T-T-R-A dot com. Well, I appreciate you sharing uh, some of your time this morning with us, doctor. Thank you so much for joining us here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you so much, Neil. It was a pleasure. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Robert Gottlieb. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio. 